The last three stages of cycling have been the hardest stages of my life. I think we've all pushed ourselves beyond anything we imagined and anything we've ever done before. It started going uphill. <laughs> it just built and built and built. Logic tells you that it's a really stupid thing to do. There's no sense to it, but you've got to do it. Who cycles through a ski resort? Must be mad. I mean, I think all of us have had points at which we've questioned our life choices. Stage six, 160k, French flat, one categorized climb, which is 2k long, uh, 2.9 incline. Can't remember what stage six was. I think that was a flat day. Stage six, where even was that? What was stage six? We're just discussing what we saw in the last uh, 40k. Yeah. And it was the back either... of Nick's wheel, yeah. the back of Hayden's wheel. Back of Gary's wheel, back of Steve's wheel, back of Rob's wheel. <laughs> what happened on stage six? That was the day before the long one. We all took that pretty easy um, because we knew what was coming up, which was like the behemoth of a stage, the um, 250 kilometer one. Day seven today, uh, we've got quite a long one. It's the longest stage in the tour for over 20 years. Seven was the long, long day. They don't get much tougher and longer than that. Just getting to lunch took forever. We're very quiet. Everyone's a little bit apprehensive about what's to come this afternoon. Today, I do want to get it out of the way. I just want it out of the way. Simple as that, get it done, move on. And then afterwards, it got grippy. We had a lot of climbing to do. Well, I think that was the hardest climb we've seen so far since we started out in Brest. I think it's category two. I heard people talking about category two. So we've got five categorized climbs. You've got a cat four, which is the easiest, obviously. You've got cat three, two, and one. And that was a category three. Excellent. So that wasn't even a category two, and I know we've got one of those to come. But the penultimate climb had a good two kilometers at 13 to 18% grade, where you just couldn't even sit down and pedal. You were going up a wall. I've had shorter days on the bike. <laughs> massage, lovely, yeah, yeah, really. It's like one of those uh, like couples yeah, like massage where it's nice and soft, yeah, just enjoyable. <laughs> yeah, just relaxing. <laughs> yeah, I, I think everybody before the, the tour started was looking at this day as being one that they weren't looking forward to. I think everybody was slightly survived, and I think, uh, yeah, credit to everybody. It shows that they put all the work in. Next day was yesterday, was it? Was it? Oh, was it not? <laughs> the strangest thing about it is every day it gets tougher and you forget entirely what you did yesterday. Is that not yesterday? <laughs> no, that was the day before. Bloody hell. <laughs> was it? <laughs> just rolls on and on and on. It's just relentless. Probably uh, the most nervous of everyone here. This is uh, a bad place for me. Got one of the worst climbs for me personally. I'm dreading it and that's the Col de Colombia. I had the worst day out ever. Everything went wrong in the Col de Colombia. I worked too hard on the first two climbs, thought I was a cycling genius. The heat got high, the legs got slow, and the first half a kilometer, I knew from then on it was game over. It's gonna be a better day today, better day. The sun is shining. The bit that I'm probably most apprehensive with is descending. There's not many mountains in Kent, so um, no, I haven't had a great opportunity to do many mountains. That's probably the one thing that you just don't have zero exposure to in the UK. A descents are crazy, like some of them drag on for half an hour. I descended with um, Richard and he was like, where did you learn to descend? And I'm like, I haven't really, this is my first time on mountains. 
The hairpins um, in particular uh, I'm finding quite challenging. They're pretty technical. It's trying to get the breaking point right in terms of the hairpin, trying to get the line, obviously trying not to swing out uh, too much because you don't know what's coming around the other side. It's very scary, <laughs> very scary. I felt absolutely terrible at the top of the second to last climb. I had to have a sit down, poured water over my head. Did not think I could keep going. Everyone was really supportive. I had a banana, popped a gel halfway up the Columbia, and I ended up making, making it to the top. That was a massive sense of accomplishment. It was strangely cathartic going back over the same road. But having had 18 months to prepare for it, it all came together. The ride was actually really nice. And yeah, honestly, guys, ride Columbia is just great. Then yesterday was, I would say, exceptionally brutal. I've never experienced anything like it. It was just brutal. I pushed myself as far as it could go yesterday. You know, we started off, I think, around about 8.30 in the morning, and I don't think we arrived here until about 8.30 in the evenings. There were two cat ones and one um, uncategorized climb, or out of category climb rather. Uh, and then for some of the mountains that are considered to be really, really special and really, really tough, you've got a hawk category climb, which is out of category. You know, the hawk category climb up Calder Prey, I have words for that which I probably shouldn't use here. I try to stay calm. I talk to myself. I kind of say, look, you're fine. Your heart rate's been at this rate before. Your legs are turning over. You have water. You can kind of talk yourself out of all of that negative. Oh my God, this is so painful. I don't want to be doing this anymore. You go to some places you don't want to go to. You have a lot of time to think and you have good thoughts and bad thoughts. If you don't kind of keep in the moment and get carried away with what's going on around you, it can be overwhelming and a bit daunting. You know, I caught myself a couple of times looking at the size of the mountains thinking, what on earth? I've got in front of me here. You just get the joy of seeing this amazing landscape that we have. And that, that's what keeps coming back. I want to be there, I want to ride because I get all of this when I get there. We all know the reasons why we're here, both from a, from a personal point of view, but also for the charity's point of view, that, that spurs me on. If you look at my bike, you'll see a picture of my dad because my dad died of leukemia pretty awful at the end. So when I'm up in the mountains and my legs are screaming and my lungs are coming through my ears and I look down and realise what he went through and you know, it's nothing in comparison. The pain that we're going through is, is nothing compared to what people are going through suffering through with, with leukaemia. So it's bearable for, from that perspective. This little boy I know called Hugo, he's battling leukaemia at the moment and I know he's been following our training and he would want us to get up back line. He's going to be wanting to see us do it and there's no way I was going to let him down. Those are the days you remember. You never remember those days with a tailwind and there was seven of you and you're just tapping along and it was easy. You remember these days. They'll look back on yesterday's stage and think that was the one that, you know, I'm proud that I made it through. I think that's where the stories are all made, you know. These guys aren't cyclists. A few of them are doing it because it is a, the pure challenge of it. Watching them go through the, the, the turmoil of fulfilling the day. It just inspires you. But I go back to one spot, the Calibier, back in 2005. It's like yesterday. It's a moment in my life that I will never forget, and it's a magical moment, a painful moment, but that's what life's all about, you know, with the, the line between pain and enjoying yourself to the tops is, is, is such a fine, fine line.